Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon with us. Uh, my name is uh, Lloyd Lee. I am the director for the Center for Regional Studies. Uh, I've, started, I've been in this position just for a few months now since October. Um, and I've been learning so much that the center does. And one of the most important aspects of the center is the support of our students um, through fellowships. And this is an important initiative for us. And I'm just wonderful to be here today to listen to our 2020, 2021 uh, graduate student fellows and their uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> I just wanna mention that uh, we are recording this um, to let you know, and also to uh, like us on our Facebook page. We have a Facebook page that became live just a few weeks ago. So if you go to Facebook, uh, go to CRS, uh, UNMC Center for Regional Studies Facebook page and like us and let, our, uh, let others know uh, as well. Uh, so thank you for coming uh, this afternoon. I, and I hope you enjoy the presentations and I wanna turn it over to our moderator for today, Dr. Rivera. Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome again. Uh, yes, uh, I think I know several of you, but certainly not everybody. And I'm Jose Rivera. I'm a research associate at the Center for Regional Studies. And uh, I know that uh, a few of you, are, you know, have uh, other commitments or COVID-19 vaccinations and stuff coming up. So we're going to go ahead and get started right away. We did ask you in the guidelines, you know, to look at five minutes as you allocated time and basically to tell us about your field of study, your topic, your uh, maybe your research questions and progress to date or findings preliminary and so forth. So we'll go ahead and get started. We, we do have to uh, do two at once more or less uh, without any questions or, or comments because these are the two that uh, are most the most pressing time uh, to leave. So we'll start with Katie Brewer and then we'll continue uh, with Lowry Lawrence. So Katie, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, and I'm at work, so I have my mask on. So if I need to, to speak up, please let me know. Um, so let me share my screen here. And so I, I, I do want to, to first thank the, the Center for Regional Studies for this today and to Alicia for helping to organize everything. Um, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that I am presenting this and also doing my research on the traditional lands of the, the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico. Um, as you can see with my title, I am looking at, at conversion and how that affects burial practices. And specifically, I'm looking at uh, the Spanish colonization and missionization that occurred with it and how that affected indigenous groups in the US Southwest. Um, and so my, my research question reflects this and I'm uh, looking at how does the introduction of a new belief system, in this case, Spanish Catholicism, uh, enforced by colonization and the associated power relations affect local mortuary practices. Uh, and um, this has, broader anthropological uh, frameworks. I am a, a, a historical archeologist studying Spanish colonialism in specific um, and indigenous responses to Spanish colonialism. But um, I'm hoping that my research can kind of create a framework for looking at this worldwide because uh, it did occur worldwide. It's still going on in various forms. And so trying to uh, help look at the, the effects of colonization through these local mortuary practices as potential indicators of identity. I have five sites that I'm looking at, um, Awadavi, Pecos, Abo, Corai, and Gran Caviera. Um, Awadavi being in Northeastern Arizona on the Hopi Reservation. It's a, a Hopi, historic Hopi Pueblo. Uh, Pecos. Uh, up northeast of us, southeast of Santa Fe along I-25. Uh, and then uh, Bo Corai and Gran Caviera are all now part of the National Park Service, the Salinas Pueblo Mission the National Monument down to the, the southeast of us. These are all Pueblos that were occupied 
Uh, around the same time, uh, the missions were built at these pueblos around the same time. Uh, and they're generally are, are nicely capped, the, the burials that I'd be looking at by um, the, the Pueblo Revolt. Um, three of these were not occupied after, uh, after the Pueblo Revolt. So kind of provide some end caps for that and um, some, some time constraints. And really what I, I'm analyzing here are both pre-contact and post-contact burials. So looking at traditional Pueblo burials and traditions prior to the arrival of the Spanish and what are traditional Catholic burial, so what do they look like and how do these two compare? Um, and, and what do Pueblo burials look like after missionization and, and colonization has occurred? Um, do they still look like traditional Pueblo burials pre-contact? or do they start to resemble Catholic burials, um, whether due to, to forced conversion or voluntary conversion. Um, and then looking at this, not only as kind of an overall thing, but also uh, does age affect this? Does social status affect this? Does the, the sex or the gender of that person affect how they were buried, what they were buried with, et cetera? And even to a certain extent, how, um, how much they would actually want to convert based on their status in society. So for example, somebody of a, a lower status might see conversion as a way to, to gain status by basically playing the system with the Spanish. Um, and I'm really, with this wanting to, to focus and center uh, the, the indigenous perspectives um, to make sure that, that it is clear that yes, the Spanish colonized, but they, uh, there is a system in place that can be maneuvered and um, indigenous peoples did not just, it, was, it wasn't a passive thing. They resisted, uh, they, they, they used the system um, and we're able to navigate and negotiate their own identities. And so I want part of what I'm looking at is how did they do that in terms of their burial practices. And so I'm looking at archival documents, both primary and secondary sources, um, historical Spanish documents, as well as any that are related to the excavation of burials at these five sites. Um, whether that's field notes or excavation records or the astrological analyses, et cetera. Um, I am relying all on archival documents. None of uh, excavation has been done by me. Um, so there, there are challenges to that, but uh, it, I feel it's uh, more respectful. I've done uh, consultations with all of the Pueblos, um, a year long consultation between the park service and the Pueblos. And, and so trying to make sure that I'm doing this in the, the most respectful way as possible, given that I am a white person looking at indigenous collections. Uh, and in doing so, I'm trying to collect basically a, a create a, an operational chain, a chin repertoire of a braille and seeing which of these markers I can identify uh, from the excavation records and from the osteological analyses and creating a database of all of this um, so that I can then perform statistical analyses uh, to determine the significance of any patterns um, or the lack of significance potentially uh, of any patterns that might occur. Also have created an index to determine uh, how much Catholic liturgy is present. Um, so uh, with zero being um, assigned to traditional Pueblo elements and one assigned to, to Catholic burial elements and averaging those out closer to zero, the more traditionally Pueblo and it is closer to one, the more traditionally Catholic it is. Um, and so as I, as I mentioned, colonization of Carl Pueblo lives, I'm hoping that this will help us understand how it affected indigenous burial practices as potential markers for identity uh, and provide a framework to look at, at colonialism globally. Um, as with probably many people, quarantine and, and COVID has uh, affected my progress, um, but I've been able to, over the past year, 
um, label and organize and go through all of the archival documents I've collected so far. Um, I have begun building my database. And as soon as that's done, I can get onto the, the actual analyses. And then uh, I'm also writing currently. Um, so getting all of my non-analysis chapters like historical background and theoretical framework, et cetera. Um, trying to get those finished and out of the way. Um, and I, again, I want to thank the, the Center for Regional Studies for the fellowship, both the fall 2019 and fall 2020. It's really helped me during this research and analysis phase. Um, and thank you to a whole bunch of other people, including the Pueblos for allowing me to actually conduct my research. Well, thank you, Katie. Gosh, uh, thank you for sticking to your five minutes also. And as I mentioned, we need to also hear from Laurie Lawrence uh, because the two of you will have to be leaving shortly. So, and then after that, Katie will come back to you as well. So uh, Laurie, if you could start your presentation, your, your field of study topic and uh, perhaps a progress report. Okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Laurie Lawrence. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the um, English Department in American Literary Studies. Uh, this, I'd, I would like to, of course, thank the center, the center for the fellowship. It's allowed me, you know, a lot more time to be in the archives and look at archival stuff than I would have ever had a chance to do. I think before that, um, that both I, the work that I've done in the archives, um, both affect my two of my chapters in my dissertation. So my research here is for my dissertation which I should be, if I get all of my edits done and everything, I should be defending on April the 28th. So looking forward, looking forward to that. So, um, my research centers on how Native American and Mexican American women wrote about domesticity in the 19th century Southwest and how those writings reflected and enacted changing domestic expectations that I argue are and were, were and are specific to the Southwest. Um, I call these changes, I say that these changes create hybrid forms of dom domesticity, which I'm calling regional dom domesticities. Um, I contend the Southwest and the competing cultural and political expectations about gender and domesticity brought on by coloniality in the region converge, converge to create specific types of domesticity tied to the conditions and the demands of the region. I contend the women of the Greater Southwest create regionally specific forms of domesticity by writing and speaking out through acceptable domestic themes, that they document these new forms in their writing, and that they practice these Southwestern regional domesticities as they negotiate the layered demands, cultures, and coloniality placed on the region. Um, so my research builds on theoretical framework by regional theorists like Stephanie Foote, Judith Betterly, Marjorie Price, Latina feminism scholars, um, native scholars um, like Brenda Child, Beth Pieto, Devin Mihishsua, uh, for the Latina feminist scholars, uh, Tay Diana Robledo, uh, Antonia Castaneda, Emma Perez, and then um, domestic rhetoric scholars, Amanda Zink, Jane Simonson, Shirley Samuels. So I feel like I'm building on this really firm base, but I'm kind of expanding that or I guess <laughs> maybe narrowing that to a very regional, from a very regional perspective. Um, my first chapter talks about competing domesticities in the home space, the domestic rhetoric of 19th century periodicals and Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton's responses to these clashing forms. Um, I spent a lot, countless hours reading old copies of the Overland Monthly. So 19th century copies of the Overland Monthly um, to get a real sense of the prevailing rhetoric of, of the time, especially as it related to the Southwest. Um, I contend that periodicals like the Overland Monthly, which perpetuated racist and sexist ideals about not only Spanish Catholic women and domesticity, but also about the region, California region itself, uh, made it necessary for Weez de Burton to speak out, but uh, domestic conventions from Spanish Catholic and Anglo cultures in the Southwest determined how she could speak out. So my work argues that who would have thought it and the squatter and the dawn, her works or her responses to this rhetoric that she sees in the Overland Monthly. Um, this is also, this chapter is also under review for possible publication at papers uh, um, on language and literature. So I'm hoping to hear back from that one sometime soon. Chapter two looks at protecting home spaces through Sarah Winnemucca's life among the Paiutes and Helen Sakakwiptiwa's 
my, me and mine, and looks at those also as collaborations with Anglo women editors. Both women and many others like them, what new women that we're discovering or rediscovering every day, um, were doing these same kind of things and they accommodated and resisted Anglo influences on their work while also working and writing within their own culture, culturally acceptable form. Um, while Mary Mann and Louise Udall, the Anglo editors for these uh, works had a direct influence on the style, both women, Winnemucca and Seka Kwaptiwa maintain their own voices to document the, the plight of the Piats and the Hopi, as well as making arguments for extended views on domesticity and gender. Chapter three looks at Tejana writers Adina de Zavada, Zavala and Jovita Gonzalez. Um, I talk about Jovita Gonzalez, I'm sorry, uh, de Zavala recreating the Alamo as a home space. And so bringing these home spaces into the public sphere and her work in preserving that space and other spaces. And I compare that with Jovita Gonzalez's um, preservation through Caballero and Duel the Thorn and her work with the folk, Texas Folklore Society. Finally, chapter four looks at gardens as sites of domestic hybridity. Um, I pair Leslie Barman Soko's Gardens in the Dunes with late 19th century and early 20th century photos from the domestic science programs in the Sherman Ranch at the Sherman Institute to argue for the importance of gardens as feminine spaces, spaces of domestic neg neg negotiation and hybridity. So finally, to close, um, I feel like focusing on regional domesticity, by focusing on that, my research expands the critical potential for regional studies to explain layered domestic practices that we sediment over time across the region. Um, I believe that where these multiple perspectives and domestic expectations converge is where the study of Southwestern women should really begin. That's it. Well, thank you, Laurie. Yes, thank uh, you. great, uh, both of you. And we'll go back. Uh, any questions or comments for Katie? Uh, and then we'll take a look at Laurie's uh, presentation as well. So questions or comments for Katie? Just wave your hand frantically so I can see you, <laughs> okay? Whoever has a question, okay? As I got 24 of you, I think, on the screen to look at. I think, Robert, you had a question or comment? Yes, I was uh, I was interested in knowing the, I might have missed this because it was going so fast, the size of the database that's being built and, and sort of the, the mix between the comparisons between uh, uh, sort of pre and post uh, uh, 1680 revolutionary times. So I have between the the five sites, there are almost 3,000 burials. Um, Pecos has has most of those, um, so that it has almost 2,000 burials, whereas the others have usually only have a, a couple of hundred. Or I think the, the second most might be. Awadavi with um, Awadavi and Gran Cavira with uh, a little over around 250 to 300 burials. Um, so there, there are some some size differences, uh, and probably the 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 statistical analysis will end up reflecting a little bit of that. Um, but it, they're, they're big enough that the statistical analyses, I can be assured that it. I can trust the significance at least of that. Um, and then I don't think any of these actually have um, burials that are, are post 1680. There, there is another mission um, that I was not able to get permission to use at, uh, in Zuni at Hawiku that has some that they think are um, post revolt based on some of the, the stratigraphy or the, um, the floors and the church, um, but I don't, I don't have that kind of detail for, for the rest of them. And as I said, three of them were abandoned um, prior to the revolt to begin with. So um, they, they definitely would not have post 1680 burials there. Oh, okay. Yeah, Gabriel has a question or comment. Go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, this is a question for Katie. Um, there's a lot of work being done at, at Hopi at Ottawa. And I was wondering, especially in terms of the Convento Kivas, 
the one that's there and also at Pecos and um, Abo at Warai. Mm -hmm. Any insights on Convento Kivas coming from your research? Um, so traditionally, or the traditional explanation for that, which I think uh, my research probably supports is the, the priests actually use that as kind of a transitional uh, piece between traditional Puebloan practices and Spanish Catholicism. Um, and in some cases, it could also be a kind of a power display by the Spanish if they were building over these kivas um, or um, if they were basically using them to, to say, okay, you need to be, to be Catholic now, let's move from this to, to this so kind of an ease um, to cut some of the tension. Um, it could also be the case that there, there are a couple of different types of missions. Um, visitas did not have a, a permanent resident priest. Uh, and so these could also still have been in use. And um, I haven't finished my analysis, so I don't know if the, the burial patterns reflect um, Catholic or traditional Pueblo and burials, but they, they could have been in use when the priests weren't there. Um, and so the priests are here thinking that they were, were, were using this as a way to ease and then the Puebloans were like, nope, um, as soon as you're gone, we're gonna do what we want basically. Um, so I haven't, like I said, I haven't done uh, the analysis. I'm just still building the database um, to, to be able to do that analysis. But uh, uh, yeah, there's a, a couple of different traditional explanations for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Katie, for both of those and um, Gabriel and Robert as well. Lowry, uh, it's time for people to maybe ask you a question or make a comment <laughs> about what you presented. So again, wave your hand like this so I can see you. Uh, anybody have a comment or a question for Lowry? Gabriel? And then Robert, yes. Yeah, uh, Laura, so uh, the writers that you're dealing with, uh, Bobita Gonzalez in Texas and uh, Reese the Burden in California, and those writers that come out, the California, California writers that come out of the uh, Bancroft collecting mm -hmm. the end of the 19th century, and then Bobita Gonzalez and others in Texas. Do we have any uh, no Mexicana writers in your study? Uh, yes, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm losing you. I am writing about, um, uh, sorry, I am writing about um, Cabeza de, uh, Fabiola Cabeza de Baca does, is in my, is in there as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Uh, yeah, her work really aligns closest with some of the stuff that I was looking at. So yeah, I, I do talk about her quite a bit. I talk about her archive and how it kind of presents its own unique space and how it kind of ties to these ideas of preservation. So I do, I do use some um, New Mexico writers as well. Yes, sir. Okay, then Robert, you had a comment? Uh, no, not a comment, a, a question. I was trying to get an understanding of how the, the activities that Laurie talked about that were uh, uh, women's spaces were identified and or were they pre-identified by Laurie as something she was looking for in writing, such as the, the gardening example. And then maybe there were other examples that uh, that you you spoke about very quickly, but it wasn't clear to me whether these were things that you were discovering through the reading or things that you were looking for in readings. So a you know depending on sort of your research approach that's that that affects the way you can interpret those kinds of things. Right, and, and I kind of went in with just this broad idea of what was considered women's work and what were, you know, just these kind of broad ideas. And then I was also going in with, you know, thinking about how women, that women were writing about recipes. They were, you know, things that were considered acceptable. They were writing about folklore, they were preserving folklore, they were writing about recipes. So I went in with just kind of this general of, let me see what I can find. And, you know, as I started reading and looking at more, it became clear that, yes, their writing was tied to that. And they were um, making these connections 
that I wasn't even making at first, or they were thinking of things in domestic terms that, you know, were outside the realm of, and I talk about that a lot more in the paper, as you know, there's this idea of like true womanhood and, you know, that women need to, or there was at the time that it needed to be, you know, you stayed at home, you were the keeper of the home and all these things. And that starts changing as we move, you know, in the 20, 19th and 20th century. And I also talk about specifically how the region itself, you know, as a modern example, um, you know, the region itself requires some things are considered women's work in some places that they aren't and others and how this evolved over time. So I started with general ideas and I've been looking um, just to see what's in the writing and kind of making a list as I go along and kind of moving in those different directions. Oh, okay, well, thank you, Laurie. Uh, feel free to sign off anytime you need to leave. We know you had something pressing to do and the same thing for Katie, we thank both of you. We'll move ahead now and make sure we have time for everybody. So on the list here is Len Becky, he's, he's on there. He's got to turn on his mic, uh, I think. Uh, can't, Len, can you turn on your mic? Hello, Lynn. Yes, there I can is. turn on my mic. Yeah, okay, uh, I think you're on now. To... Yeah, go ahead, your field of study and your topic and any uh, reports okay. you want to give so, today. I got this little, um, are you guys seeing my shared screen? Is it's coming on up? now. There we go, it's okay. there. Um, and if we could get this into present, yep, all right. So um, I'm uh, doing this on Wi-Fi. I'm headed for a COVID vaccine after this. So um, oh, okay. this, uh, disculpen. Um, so today, um, I'm, uh, thank you all for, for inviting me to talk. And thank you, of course, to the CRS um, for um, uh, my continued fellowship with you guys. Um, my research is on place name erasure in Nuevo Mexico. And it really stems from this really basic observation that if you look at what are called official topographic maps of New Mexico um, or Nuevo Mexico. These are a very poor reflection of Indo-Hispano Nuevo Mexicano oral traditions. Um, additionally, they these maps virtually ignore place naming practices um, in Pueblo or Apache indigenous languages. And these omissions are intentional. Um, and sort of how do I know that? I know that from looking at um, field notes from the US Geological Survey. Here's one of those field notes. And they write that names are generally Spanish hyphen Indian, spelling and application generally local. Spelling and gender may be somewhat different from true Spanish written without a capital letter, since usually <laughs> such names have been applied by uneducated native people. So let's break that down a bit, right? So we've got some racist ideologies here, right? Real Mexicanos are racialized as Indian or native and, and not in terms of their culture, but in terms of their race, uh, as opposed to my use of Indo-Hispano, which is about culture. Um, you've got some classist ideologies. Lynn, we lost you. Lynn, you're on mute. Um, and all of these are funneled through um, You're muted again, Len. Um, am I still coming through or no? You're back on now. Okay. Um, sorry, Rad. So all of these are funneled through language ideology. The fact that no Mexicano Spanish is considered to be different from true Spanish sort of um, rhetorically justifies changing the names because they're not actually Spanish to begin with. They're not in any actual language. Um, here's an example of what that looks like. Uh, this place is um, out by San Alfonso. Uh, it's called La Mesa Huérfana in Spanish. And this is what they write about it. The name La Mesita de Gersana has been changed to Black Mesa. Uh, the field engineer offers the two names, Black Mesa and uh, Mesita de Gersano. Um, it's also identified by this Tuño, uh, an Indian name 
my belief is it's um, Tewa. Um, and what that ends up looking like on the map is just Black Mesa, right? Um, and then uh, beyond that, they're um, internally inconsistent. So this is a map, if it will load, um, in a different scale that's identifying this little feature as all of this area as La Mesita de Gersano. Um, so they've already got um, a gender swap in there as well in, in the word. So you have all of these um, sort of ways that these names are being altered to, um, right, to either reflect the Anglo usage or um, that are altered because the uh, field workers didn't know Spanish well enough. And so my project, I call it the Manito Topos project, um, aims to document names in Nuevo Mexicano oral tradition. Um, to date, um, I've been successful in documenting 759 traditional names. That's as far south as um, sort of Ro, Nuevo Mexico, and as far north as um, the Rio Huerfano Valley in um, Colorado. Um, I've got a pending publication in the Journal of the Southwest um, that I just recently got news from. Um, and I've got visits planned um, to the National Archives to look at more of those field notes and uh, for new field work um, in the summer. And that's the bike I'll be doing the field work on. Um, so I hope that was within my time. Yes, and of course, uh, the bicycle reminds me, uh, uh, you know, the miles that you put in, how many miles did you already put in on a bicycle? Um, so um, this is a new bicycle, but two years ago, I did the same thing over summer. I um, put in about 500, maybe six. Amazing. Um, it's probably yeah. going to be the same. Yeah. Or a little more. Yeah. Okay, Lynn, yeah, thanks. Uh, questions or comments for Lynn? Congratulations on the publication. Let's see, Melissa? I, I just um, wanted to so, ask. Go ahead, Lynn. Melissa, then Naomi, then Gabriel. We've got three of them. Okay. Melissa, go ahead. go ahead. Hi, Lynn. This sounds fantastic. Um, I'm wondering, how are you double checking the indigenous names, the Tewa names and the Apache names? Um, so I've been in um, communication with um, Andres Abogal about those. Um, and Andres Abogal does, does research with um, Nambe Tewa um, for the people that aren't Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Naomi, you had something? I think you need to uh, unmute your voice. I apologize. I was not raising my hand. No questions for me. Oh, no Go questions. Ahead, oh, no. Okay. Okay, then I think Gabriel was next, yes. So Len, uh, since you mentioned uh, Ro, New Mexico, and uh, yeah. I believe the original name was La Rueda. So is there a, what's going on with alliteration there? Or um, are there so two different, the, uh, should we not think about uh, you are Right, you are correct. Um, the, the original name is in the plural, Las Ruedas. Um, it's actually a settlement that was about two miles um, south of Ro is today and that was um, forcibly depopulated. Um, people were forced out of their homes, disowned. Um, there's stories, I mean, I haven't heard these stories, but I'm told that there are stories of people carrying their mattresses on their backs and um, going to Pecos or La Otra Banda or, or other little um, places in the area. How did we get Roe? Uh, Ro is the uh, station master's name. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, already. Uh, anyone else uh, before we move on? Just congratulations on your dissemination work and your publication. Yeah, publication forthcoming. Thank and you, Robert. We got the New Mexico Historical Review editor here. I hope he heard that. <laughs> Larry, welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, let's move on uh, with Naomi as uh, the next uh, presentation. If you could tell us your field of study and your topic and a progress report. 
And you might need to turn on your mic, Naomi. Is it turned off, uh, Alicia, or there it is? There. Hello, okay. everyone. Okay. I'm trying to uh, do a we got uh, you. share screen here. Yeah, um, go ahead, Naomi. Oh, uh, hopefully with my PowerPoint. And uh, for some reason, okay, uh, I apologize. I thought I had all the um, technical situations figured out. <laughs> uh, and it's not looking that I, I can share my, like I could share my, my screen here for some reason. Um, okay. I did have a PowerPoint um, and, but I can also, um, it would be nice to good. visual. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to show you maps. And um, so my name is Naomi Ambris. I am a PhD student in American studies. Uh, I do want to thank the Center for Regional Studies for this fellowship and everyone involved in the process so my title is Afro Mestizaje in the U.S. Southwest, Mexico, and Cuba. My interest in investigating the racial formations of Afro Mestizos in the U.S. Southwest, Mexico, and Cuba have been informed my, by my personal uh, questions. My last name, Ambriz, derives from a small fishing port in a former Portuguese slave port in Ambriz, Angola, in West Africa. So although my Mexican-American family um, histories never mentioned their African influences, my paternal family's uh, African uh, phenotypes and features have always been present and visible. My investigation into uh, to this, it's a historical and comparative analysis of Afro-Mestizos in the US Southwest, Mexico and Cuba, and the establishments of Afro-Mestizos racial formations. So this is really a study of the present that sees a legacy and reverberation of the original Spanish casta system. Um, and in this, and my study also bridges American studies and Afro Latinx scholarship through an interdisciplinary investigation in order to understand the complexities of Afro Mestizos lived experiences and narratives in, of the US Southwest, Mexico, and Cuba. So, more, spe more specifically, I do interrogate uh, the Spanish colonizers' casta systems by challenging how racial mixing or mestizaje obscures the close knit ties of, and alliances between indigenous and African peoples. So I also explain, and I explain these, um, I, how these identities become more pronounced in some areas, uh, but not in others, and how they uh, form differently in, in these regions. So for example, the casta systems that were Spanish brought to the US Southwest look very different than the ones implemented in Mexico and Cuba. So the questions I ask are first, how has a framing of mestizaje erased Afro-mestizos uh, identities? And second, how uh, Afro-mestizos define and understand their identity formations in similar or different ways in the US Southwest, Mexico and Cuba? And lastly, how have Afro-mestizos resisted, recreated and or reinforced racial hierarchies that obscure blackness in each region? So, I hope um, the, in the fields of American studies and Afro Latinx studies, the study of Afro descendants, particularly in the US Southwest, is an understudied region and it's most often overlooked. Um, I hope that my, my research will contribute to the growing literature of Afro descendants in the US Southwest, in Mexico, and Cuba has a lot more, but um, also contribute um, it back to the US Southwest. And um, I envision this research to reach more of a transnational uh, scale and, and, and forming more of a Afro-descendancy uh, literature. In particular, uh, looking at more of the uh, women movements in these um, Afro-descendants movements. So uh, we went looking at women particularly within the Afro-descendant movements. And that is it for me. Okay, great. Thank you, Naomi. And uh, once again, just as a reminder, if you have a comment or a question, just wave your hand like I'm doing here so I can see you. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody? Uh, 
Uh, Robert? Yeah, it wasn't clear to me. How is it that you're going about this study of the Afro-descendant Misty, Mestizo community? I'm looking at the Casta systems. So uh, comparing the, the, the Casta well, systems. Where, where, is that, where, where is your information coming from? I, I understand this, the framework. I just don't understand where you're getting the information from. Oh, where the literature, you mean? Where, where is your where is your information or data coming from? Oh, so um, U.S. Southwest uh, particular cost of systems, Spanish cost of systems here, and also I'm um, currently also looking at Mexico right now. So uh, from Mexico, Mexico literature there, uh, writers in Mexico and um, throughout the 18th, 19th centuries. Did that answer your question? Or is that not clear? Not, not very clear, but I, I'm getting a better idea now what you're trying to do or how you're trying to do it. I have a question. I mean, what about Cuba? You know, we can certainly re relate to the Southwest, New Mexico, Mexico, uh, Cuba, a bit more distant off. Does, does what kind of, what does that add to your analysis? I'm sure it does. So I'm just yeah. kind of curious how that yeah. works in. Well, it's actually interesting because in Cuba, it's a, a black and white binary. So the indigenous is left off. And um, so I argue that they erase indigeneity in Cuba. So, and also I, I am looking at the Afro-Cuban population in the U.S. Southwest, particularly in Albuquerque. In the 1990s, um, uh, there were families that were Afro-Cuban families um, relocated from uh, Miami and also other areas in the US that um, the, they were relocated to Albuquerque. So there's a particular uh, group or um, population here in Albuquerque of Afro-Cubans that relate back to, yeah. Sure, what about even further away places like Venezuela? I mean, yeah. I, I know they're not part of your case, but I mean, did, did did you look at that at all, or you have any comments about Venezuela? Not particularly Venezuela. I don't focus particularly there. Um, uh, if you're thinking about more of a you know com communist ideology, I'm not. I haven't looked at Venezuela particularly, but I do look at, for instance, Central America or Afro descendants in Central America, and even further south. Um, Brazil uh -huh. has a lot of more. Uh, uh, literature there and history uh, after the ascendancy afro Brazilians, um, but that's a that's I would look into. Uh, it's a good um, observation in terms of if thinking about Cuba and communism or and um, Venezuela. That would be sure. sure. Oh, okay, I saw two hands, Rebecca and then Gabriel. Um, thank you and thank you, uh, Naomi, for your work. I wonder if um, you're also looking at. A lot of research that's coming out now about the um, enslaved people that would escape from the U.S. Uh, states of Texas and Louisiana and go into Mexico at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's definitely um, so the mi yeah so migration patterns. Um, that's because that's the complexity of this the, the research and I've come across. Um, there's definitely literature there, but because the historical, um, and in fact, I'm actually uh, taking a Afro-Mexico culture uh, course right now, which has been so in, uh, informative and, and instrumental in this uh, by Dr. Uh, uh, Dora Coriaga out of um, Coleman at a um, university, uh, Chicano studies here. So uh, this is what we're recently more talk, uh, talking about um, where the border is so porous and and the complexity of the historical um, migrations uh, between the United States or what became the United States in Mexico. So definitely um, we're trying to kind of unearth that a little bit more, yeah. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. One last, that's the last question then we'll have to move on. So go ahead. No question. Hi, Dr. Merlin. Oh, no question. <laughs> oh. Is Naomi still? Naomi, can I, yes. can I, it was more of a comment mm -hmm. and okay. some useful information. Um, 
there is a really famous figure in uh, Mexico, colonial Mexico. Uh, he's a poet, Troador. It was called El, uh, El, El Negro Poeta. Mm -hmm. And uh, El Negro Poeta was uh, famous for uh, these, verbal, these verbal contests with uh, other such uh, uh, tr troubadours. But what's interesting for New Mexico is that you know, I, although El, El Negro Poeta didn't make it up here, obviously, his words and his trovas did. Mm. And this whole idea mm. of the trova or the point counterpoint uh, dueling match, verbal matches that are, they proliferate all over. There's a lot of it in Cuba currently called repentismo, which is just this phenomenal form of uh, an update of the, uh, of those, um, verbal jousts that would happen. So you might want to look into the, and ironically, or I don't know if ironically, but his name, his name in the documents is Jose Vasconcelos. Yeah. Not to be confused with, uh, you know, Vasconcelos and Mestizaje. Okay. So those, uh, those forms do, tra do travel and circulate. And they're coming out of uh, conditions in Mexico that involve Castas and then a sort of subversion of the casta because he was so he was so articulate, or dexterous in his um, in his art. Just a fabulous example. And Gabriel, I believe you discuss uh, the poet oh, in your book yeah, about well, the book, Valley uh, of all places, right? In my book, the Book of Archives, I write up of one of these trovas. Yeah, okay. right, in the imagination. So it's and and, and I was just doing a. Uh, uh, looking at an interview from 1978, where a uh, a gentleman in northern New Mexico is recite, reciting the trovas, mm. right? So they persist in the imagination and in the verbal, the verbal creativity of people. But so I think Jose asked me, "Why are you writing about the viejo Vilmas and the negro poeta? They were they were never in New Mexico, yeah. Historically, well, the words were right, the poems were." Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thank great. You Thank you for the, that addition there. And uh, Tanya, are you here? I think you are. I've seen you. Let's see if I can find you again. Tanya. Uh, you should check I'll out the Wapango you. too, because the Wapango in that area is an important verbal kinds of arrangement that comes out of the sort of Afro-Mexican tradition. Yeah. Okay. All right, Tanya. Um, hi, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tanya Garcia, and I'm a PhD candidate in American Studies. And I would like to thank the Center for Regional Studies for supporting my research. Um, Dr. Lee, of course, for being the director. Alicia for organizing the event. Dr. Rivera um, for facilitating. And also Dr. Melendez, who I see and worked with, and he's really helped shape my work. So um, my progress is re that recently I just passed my dissertation prospectus defense. And so um, for my short presentation, thank you, I'm going to just read kind of an excerpt from the prospectus to give an overview of my project. Um, so my presentation is called the active presence of haunting in the Southwest. Um, haunt haunting is a concept brought forth by American sociologist Avery F. Gordon, and it provocatively applies across the fields of critical trauma studies, visual culture, and Southwest studies within an American context, uh, excuse me, within American studies. French philosopher and post-structural theorist Jacques Derrida invents the term hauntology, fusing haunting and ontology in a, what's called a portmanteau to invoke the figure of the ghost that which is neither present nor absent, neither dead nor alive. So haunting is a kinetic occurrence that it performs memory work, which brings forth a need to confront vestiges of the past. The concept of haunting denotes an active presence urging a critical examination of once overlooked images, narratives, memories, stories, and histories. Jacques Derrida's implementation of hauntology pertains to various fields of knowledge, including psychoanalysis, music, political theory, architecture, and Afrofuturism. 
Gothic literature is a genre of British literature, but also American literature, um, incorporates haunting as a theme in canonical British novels, such as Emily Bronte's Withering Heights, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and also Toni Morrison's classic American novel, Beloved, and also the Turn of the Screw novella by American and British author, Henry James. So themes and theories of haunting extend to interdisciplinary work in the discipline of American studies, especially related to overlapping socio-historical contexts with literature in the American Southwest. Central themes of haunting, trauma, history, and memory arise in family photography, revealing pertinent living history, and an intergenerational ancestral legacy intimately linking the past, present, and future. So my dissertation project employs haunting as a theory utilized to uncover how the past vividly remains in the present regarding family history, photography, and identity, while ultimately seeking to discover how haunting permeates a wider context of shared historical trauma. The theory of haunting is similar to that of spectral analysis, which is applied in the field of psychology as an analytic lens. Oral histories as well as written histories often account for gaps in narratives and fragmented memories, which can act as ghosts living in unconventional archives and extend across the arc of history. So my project aims to address how gaps in ghosts occupy spaces waiting to be uncovered, explored, and reinserted into living histories. Undervalued stories hold the power to educate and inform interdisciplinary scholars and encouraging new and challenging ways of understanding. So my dissertation project argues that ghosts of the past lurk in the present and hold scholars accountable for recognizing lesser known events and memories of unspoken traumas. Present in both formal and informal individual family photographs and photographic albums, specters or ghosts actively appear to remind the viewer who um, of family members who are once lost to land dispossession, cultural displacement, and or death within Southwest historical context. Memories and recovered voices haunt the past and present as specters or something that haunts or perturbs the mind, evoking a renewed interest in uncovering hidden histories. This dissertation, dissertation project's goal is to discover how haunting and spectral analysis bridge psychoanalysis literary analysis and visual culture via photographic images while informing my own family history and the broader Indo-Hispano community as a site of critical analysis centered in the American Southwest. Uh, forthcoming research for this project includes a close visual analysis of historical photographs in order to discern how images evoke haunting absent presences of lost antepasados or uh, the Spanish for ancestors, um, living histories along the Southwest borderlands of Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado come alive through hearing oral histories, uncovering photographs and seeking out hidden written documents such as personal notes as well as public census records located in digital databases. Um, so contextualizing this project within yet primarily outside of meta-narratives of Spanish, Mexican, and American colonial history of the Southwest is necessary to frame conversations on haunting in order to understand how to reconcile past traumas with current awareness of complex colonial legacies. So that's just kind of a brief overview of this project, which is, as you may be able to tell, has varying uh, levels and layers of it. Um, so uh, I want to thank you again for listening to sure. that. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to address those. Sure. Let's go ahead and start the process here. Questions or comments? Anybody? Uh, again, go like this. Lloyd, here we go. Sure. Uh, thank you, Tanya. I think it's really interesting that what you're examining. Uh, I don't think I heard anything in there about in terms of some of your methodology about using fiction literature as, as a format in terms of the data you're gathering or, or are you doing that? Yes, actually, um, I'm looking at some of Dr. Melendez's books, such as the Book of Archives, which is um, kind of an imaginative um, 
view of Southwest history. So I'm sort of looking at some um, literary sources, also uh, like Rudolfo Anaya's text, um, since he was a major um, Hispanic author in the Southwest. Um, so that's part of my archive. I know I didn't really go into to detail about that. Um, so I'm looking at historical records and then also some literary text. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. That answers your question. Yeah, yeah. You also mentioned oral histories, Tanya, and have you? I'm sure you've done some interviews of that already in New Mexico and Colorado. Actually, I haven't, and that's something someone on my committee brought up. Um, I'm thinking of possibly doing interviews. I'm not sure. Um, mostly, I've just kind of read Southwest texts with uh, oral histories within them. Um, but that's something I might consider for my project um, to sort of get kind of a firsthand account of life in the Southwest um, from people in Northern New Mexico, Southern Colorado. Sure. So um, that might be a, another good source. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, questions, comments? Uh, I guess uh, Samuel Truitt, welcome. Thank you. This sounds like a great project. Um, and I've been doing a fair bit of work recently in uh, genealogical work in the Southwest and Northern Mexico. And there's just a lot of really interesting ways on platforms like ancestry.com that family mm -hmm. photographs are being not only posted, but kind of shared uh, among families. And I was wondering if that might be a source that you're aware of or thinking of using. Yes, thanks for the question. That's. Um... Definitely what I've been doing recently for my research, aside from looking at scholarly text, is searching on familysearch.org, which is um, affiliated with the Mormon church. And so there's really good records like census records and old photographs that I've been able to um, put on my family tree. So I'm doing a lot of genealogical work through ancestry.com. Um, and familysearch.org. And there are just tons of uh, records that I've been able to access that have been really interesting, um, especially photographs that I've discovered from actually relatives of mine who've posted things. So I'm kind of mapping our family tree and that's definitely a source for the project. And um, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Tanya. We're running a little bit behind, so we're going to have to move ahead. Uh, Joseph Moreno, I know you're here somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, yeah, here he is. Uh, you, have, you have your mic on? Okay, he's going to do a screen sharing. Yeah, jump right into it. Thank you. All righty. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Joseph Moreno. I'm a PhD candidate in language literacy and sociocultural studies out of the College of Education. Um, I'm blessed to be working with my dissertation chair, Dr. Rebecca Blue Martinez. So thank you for being here, Rebecca. And so my, the topic of my uh, project is exerting positive Nuevo Mexicano agency through critical community-based language and culture curriculum. It's really long to say uh, that I'm interested in Nuevo Mexicano language and cultural maintenance and revitalization. So a little bit of background uh, with me. I'm from Bernalillo, born and raised, well, born in Albuquerque because we don't have any hospitals in Bernalillo, so born in Albuquerque, raised in Bernalillo. I'm a fourth or fifth generation uh, Bernalillo. My families are come from the Rio Puerto Valley and Navajo Canyon in Northern New Mexico. Um, it, what prompted this project many years ago um, was my involvement in the Matachinas. So the Matachinas, if you're not aware, um, Bernalillo is pretty well known for our tradition in that it's a ritual dance drama that encompasses European elements, Aztec elements, Rio Grande Pueblo, Anglo-American, Nuevo Mexicano elements. We see the dance performed for Catholic feast days, typically in the greater Southwest uh, and Mexico, in Nuevo Mexicano, Pueblo, and Mexicano communities. And we celebrate our fiestas de San Lorenzo on August 9th, 10th, and 11th since uh, 1693 is what our oral tradition says. So my study on the Matachinas began at Colorado College and then I pursued a master's in LLSS um, from 06 to 08, but I was really interested in this idea of Spanish identity in Matachinas. How does that all intersect with race, class, and power? So here I am. Um, the purpose of my project was to 
uh, create a curriculum that really addresses how race, class, and power intersect with Nuevo Mexicano identity, um, with culture, our language, our history, and using the Matachinas dance in our fiestas as a way to do that. So I created a unit that was four weeks long, and it was taught to a group of adults in Bernalillo. It didn't include any children just to get it um, through IRB a little bit quicker. And I'm happy to say that I actually had the course that and I taught it myself um, in January, January 11th through May, uh, February 4th. And I conducted the interviews right after that. So that is done, thankfully. So I'm in the data analysis portion of my project. Uh, the CRS um, fellowship has really helped me through this particular project to develop course materials, to offer the course. So a number of different things that it has helped me with. And so that said, um, I offered the course for four weeks. I did follow-up interviews. During uh, offering a course on Zoom during the pandemic was a little bit of a, a challenge, um, but we got through it. And so what I was looking at really was, I'm sorry, I don't know if I had my questions here. I was looking at three questions, or I am. How do the uh, Bernalillo and Rebo Mexicanos react to this critical curriculum that looks at the intersection of race, class power with our traditions, particularly the Matachinas and its subcustoms. Um, what aspects of that curriculum did they find positive or negative or a combination of both for high school instruction? And then what aspects of that curriculum would they advise or revise? So that said, the preliminary results, um, they overall, they viewed it as positive. Um, they really liked topics that centered around kinship, uh, land, uh, Querencia, for example, our customs, our matachinas, as they talked about family, there were a lot of emotional times in the class. They really, really enjoyed the matachinas. So in order to take the course, they had to be, they had to identify as Nuevo Mexicano, Spanish, Hispano, or Hispanic. They had to be 18 years or, of age or older. And they also had to be familiar with the um, tradition of the matachinas and the fiestas, whether by participating or observing it and they had to live uh, within the, the city limits of Bernalillo. So the negative portions though, the research is saying that Nuevo Mexicanos typically use the Spanish identity label as a way, as a, as a tool to combat Anglo-American discrimination throughout time in the history of New Mexico, particularly around statehood, but that they also use it as a weapon to discriminate against Mexicanos and Native Americans as well. So it's dual, there's a dual um, purpose there. But we didn't see that in the class. So preliminarily, it will take a little bit more analysis, but preliminarily we saw that they're using heritage to, as a weapon, as a tool to do the same thing. So they're saying our culture, our traditions, we're drawing the line there. It's not necessarily an identity label. Other ways that they see a combination of positive and negative is in language use. Obviously there's a traumatic history of Spanish in our community, um, especially with the schools uh, having removed us and stripped us of our language. Uh, so there's this there's this um, excitement to relearn it and also a frustration in, in not learning it in the first place and the reasons why it wasn't handed down generationally. So uh, as I mentioned, I, I finished with all that. As I uh, mentioned to Rebecca a few weeks ago, my my um, a room in my house is full of note cards the old school way. Um, and so I'm in, I'm in the thick of that data analysis portion. And that's all I have. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, uh, comments or questions? Yeah, we're back on full screen now, so I can see. Uh, I, I need to kind of ask again because I'm not sure who's asking or who had got a comment or a question. Okay, I don't see anybody, so let's move ahead. Uh, gain a little bit of time here. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Carlin, uh, you're next here. I think I've seen you here somewhere too. Uh, here she is. Yeah, Carlin, go ahead and tell us your, your field of study and uh, what, what you're working on and in in some kind of progress report. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Carlin Pinkins. I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of History. Um, and I want to thank the Center for Regional Studies for giving me the opportunity um, to be able to be a fellow and um, try to pursue my research. Um, my topic is called Finding Their Place, uh, Black Homesteading um, in this Territory and State of New Mexico. 
And uh, the title is sort of a play on uh, the idea of outsiders needing to know their place uh, to adapt to certain environments. And so with finding their place, uh, it's both about black homesteaders um, finding land or finding a place where they could prosper for themselves and in some cases for others as well as uh, they're having to navigate and negotiate their ways through the socioeconomic, political and environmental conditions to make that happen. Um, and hopefully this project will piece together one part of the black experience in New Mexico and show how it was similar to experiences of black homesteaders or black people in general who traveled west to leave the Jim Crow South, um, but also show how um, New Mexico made things different for them as opposed to uh, what those folks might have experienced in Oklahoma or California or someplace else. Um, the questions that I'm interested in uh, answering with this project is, who were the black homesteaders who came here? Why did they come? How did they survive? Uh, what were their relationships like with their neighbors, uh, urban and rural? And how did their homesteading stories end if it did in fact end? And how does that change the way we traditionally view homesteading? Um, a big part of the dissertation was going to revolve around uh, stories of individual families uh, that I've come to know of through working with the African American Museum and Cultural Center of New Mexico over the years. And so I'm going to look at Blackton near Roswell, um, the Grover Pettis family uh, homestead north of Las Cruces, and the Mesa Development Center, the water utility company they founded in 1967. Uh, John Outley and Virginia Ballou Outley's homestead in the east end of Albuquerque. Also the elder homestead in Albuquerque, uh, what we now know of today is the International District. And I'm also going to look at uh, Vado, uh, where Frank Boyer, who's known as one of the founders of Blackdom, moved to in, uh, with part of his family in the 1920s or so. And so this academic year was going to be uh, my big chance to get into the archives and actually put my hands on some uh, documents as well as uh, visit a lot of these places, talk to the descendants and uh, get my hands on their pictures and documentations and hear their stories. But um, thanks COVID, that didn't uh, manage to happen. And so, um, what I wanted to do in the archives was be able to put my hands on more homestead patents um, from other black homesteaders that I did not know about. And so maybe uh, contrast their stories and experiences with the ones that I knew of. And hopefully if I found them in different areas or of New Mexico, be able to expand uh, the geographical scope of black homesteading in the territory and state. Um, but I also really wanted to visit the places as well, uh, particularly with the Pettis family homestead to uh, see the environmental conditions for myself and um, see if they've changed at all or any. Um, I forgot to start my timer because I was nervous. So I'm not sure where I am with time. Um, so like one of the big issues I found with all the, the, the issue with Blackthorn is that it's pretty much already well written about Dr. Timothy Nelson did his dissertation on it uh, out of UTEP and also a colleague of mine, Austin Miller did his master's thesis on it as well. And uh, what uh, Tim Nelson's work did was kind of expose the history versus memory paradox. There is a myth around Blackthumb. Um, I'll use myth for the time being uh, around its founding. And that contrasts differ, it differs a lot from what Tim Nelson was able to find in the documentation. But what I hope to do is to uh, talk to the descendants of L.K. Wagner, who's one of the last school teachers of Blackdom, and uh, get their stories and, and their documentation and kind of see what his individual goals were in finding 
uh, or getting a homestead in Blackham. Um, also, uh, issues with the archives is that, well, I couldn't go. And um, I had a lot of struggle being able to find um, homestead patents that weren't like in the numbers of gosh knows how many. And it's hard to figure out, you know, what's important and what's useful if you can't really do the digging for yourself. I was in touch with a state archivist, Dina Hunt, and she was able to find a few things for me, but she was also doing research for a lot of other people. And so our communication has been sparse and um, those inquiries haven't turned up a lot as of yet. And um, so what I really hope to do is um, I'm trying to touch base with uh, get interviews over the phone. It was uh, an interview with Brenda Dabney, who's the granddaughter of John Alley, uh, who had a homestead in the East End. Uh, fell through recently, but I'm still trying to make those connections as much as I can during this time. And hopefully when things open up, I'll be able to get into the archives and um, find more materials. Yeah. But that's it. Okay, well, thank you. A question or a comment from anybody? Let me kind of scan the room here, see if I see any hand go up. RC. Hi, Carlin. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you said one of the things you were looking for was, you know, who were they? Who were these people? And where did they mostly come from? Was it Louisiana? Was it from the Southeast? Uh, and, and how were they received by New Mexico? So what I know so far is um, it's kind of interesting. So the story I know of so far, a lot of them are from out of Blackthumb and um, Frank Boyer is actually from the same county as me in the state of Georgia. And so finding out that little tidbit made me more interested in this topic. But what the uh, citizens of Blackthumb did was they put out ads pretty much in national newspapers uh, to call people to homestead in the area. And so a lot of those folks did come from like Southern states like South Carolina. Um, but um, also a lot of, from the stories I'm getting outside of, outside of the Blackton narrative, there are a lot of people that came in from Texas and Louisiana fleeing violence. Um, and some people were on their way further west to California and ended up just staying here in, in New Mexico. So I'm excited about digging more into that. Um, Frank Boyer himself was a, a, was a teacher, graduated from Morehouse. Uh, and I think there's other stories like his in Blackthumb. You know, uh, homesteading is an ar ar agricultural endeavor. And a lot of those settlers were, settlers, a lot of those homesteaders were not, uh, necessarily farmers. So some of them had to come out here, uh, you know, with the skills they had and try to learn how to farm to be able to yeah. um, make their homesteads work. So yeah, I'm interested in digging a little bit more and uncovering a lot more of those stories. Oh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Camilla Roybal, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, yeah, go ahead and tell uh, us yeah. about your project and, okay. so, and so forth. So, my name is Carmela Roybal. I am from uh, the Pueblo of Oke Owinge, Sakone Owinge, and the Embudo Valley. So, I am very much um, a Norteña, uh, Nuevo Mexicana, and I take a lot of pride in that. So, I hope this reflects in my research. I do have a PowerPoint and I think I'm gonna share part of it just to give you a little bit of the background. So early on, let's see if I'm able to share my screen. Okay. There we go. So early on in my research, I've been looking at over overdose and substance use death here in the state of New Mexico, in my own community in Northern New Mexico. Um, started collecting a lot of data, creating data sets to find out how we compared. And I was really interested and, and, and curious and trying to untangle this, 
experience that we're having, this, this opiate epidemic that has caused generations of addiction within our state. I find out that 30% of our state is impacted through these surveys. And I start looking at native communities and trying to figure out how, how pervasive is this pandemic? I'm looking at the contemporary landscape, wanting to change this contemporary landscape. I find out you're looking at overdose death rates and extremely high. And in some of our Pueblos, we're looking at a 70% addiction rate, whether it's alcohol or other drugs. And then we're looking at the stigma. So in Rio Riba County, we see these high rates. We have this stigma. We see the changes to our landscape. And coming from a place, you know, so powerful, so full of culture, generation after generation, I have a hard time comprehending or understanding why we were dealing with all of these different issues. Being from Okewinge, we have generation after generation, right? Our language, our culture, Hapo Winge, um, Hikaria. So I designed this project to look at Rio Riba County specifically, right? We have these legacies, so we can contrast, we can look at both of them. We're seeing the social ills right now that we're experiencing, but then we also see that cultural wealth. So I'm very interested, I design a project. I spend over a year and a half working in facilities, treatment facilities, trying to find the question that was going to lead me to untangle this, this you know, phenomenon, this, this mess that has just created so much um, deficit within our communities. So the project, my, uh, the title of my project is Intersectionality and the Lived Experience of Inequality. So intergenerational addiction, opiate use, and the constrained choices of women caregivers, which might sound kind of strange in the fact that, um, why would I interview caregivers? So spending an unsurmountable amount of time in Rio Riba County, I realized that the women caregivers are those that had a lot of the answers to understanding and unpacking the impacts of this addiction and kind of um, dissecting intergenerational addiction, defining it and really trying to change that landscape. Who is it impacting and how do we stop it? How do we find policy and different um, pieces that are gonna change you know, this landscape? So I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology Okay, so here's, um, this is my research question and a couple other questions there, but I'm gonna kind of um, move quickly through this because I'd rather answer questions and update you on where I am with the study. So the main question is what's the lived experience of women caregivers who are navigating and resisting intergenerational addiction in the face of opiate, the opiate epidemic. So lots of previous research really hones in on individuals that are experienced um, substance use disorders. I wanted to focus on the family. I wanted to know how pervasive and how do we stop it? So looking at Rio Riba County, we find out that over 60% uh, of the families are grandparents raising grandchildren as a result. We also find that 30% of um, infants born within this county have been exposed to opiates. So we're looking at long-term effects, right? We're looking at uh, early education centers filled with individual, with children that are gonna be um, dealing with opiate withdrawal. This is gonna change and shape the way that the future of Northern New Mexico will look, looks now and will look, you know, moving forward. So as I started to conduct, you know, interviews and pre-interviews, I found out you know, this, this is actually a couple excerpts from my initial interviews prior going to going into the dissertation. I wanted to know is, you know, who does it affect? And here I found it was the women. And that's why I chose the women. And I found that they were those that were really holding together the families, the tradition, the language and everything. So here's a little bit about my research design and methods. So I did 40 in-depth interviews. Um, so I did uh, 12 Native American, about 20 Latina women and about 12 um, white women within the community. So this overall project takes an intersectional approach and looks across at all of their social locations and how that changes or what their experience is. Okay, so it involved lots of participant observation and um, 
attending community events, but this is where I am. So after, um, so during COVID, I was able to defend the prospectus um, in early on January. Um, so during prior to the COVID shutdown, I was able to have about 25 interviews under my belt. So throughout the course of the pandemic, I had built relationships early on within throughout the community in Northern New Mexico. So I was able to conduct lots of interviews over Zoom or phone calls, things like that. So I was able to continue the work, analyze, and right now I am in the writing and I hope to defend this um, at the beginning, at the end of the semester, if not the beginning of summer. So I have three chapters right now and this is kind of just their overview. So um, the first really looks at the embodiment of health inequalities and how women kind of resist those inequalities and the impact that it has on them. And then I can answer questions or talk about why these women, right? Why it's so important that we really look at and understand these fundamental causes of this pandemic. Um, my second chapter really looks at constrained choice and the hidden costs of caregiving. I say hidden cost, because usually we look at it as in an economic sense. You know, what are the costs? But here I look at the constrained choices and everything that every woman who is dealing with this had to forego in order to care for a loved one. That means educational opportunities, jobs, many have to leave retirement, others have to lose house, they lose houses, funeral costs, and all of the different pieces that go into that. The third chapter looks at intergenerational addiction and the lay perspectives and experiences versus expert. So there, these chapters are very, um, they, there's just so much information and components. I wish I could share it all here, but I know we have five minutes. So I'd love to answer questions and just have more of a dialogue regarding my research. Okay, yeah, we have time for one question or comment because we still have uh, three other presentations. So who wants to have that one question or comment that's really critical? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, I don't see anybody, so let's uh, move ahead. Uh, okay, uh, Moises Santos. Hi everyone. Share my screen here. Okay, um, thank you all. For having me today. Um, my name is Moisés Santos. I'm a PhD candidate in history. Um, my topic is titled Alternative Chicanx Educational Activism in the U.S. Southwest, uh, 1935 to 1975. Um, and so I look at what I mean by alternative education is um, an, an education that is different from the U.S. institutions of learning, which we know are often exclusionary or oppressive to communities of color in particular, have Eurocentric curriculums and pedagogies. Um, but I also look at something that's an alternative to the sort of established ethnic studies um, discipline as well, which has, usually has culturally relevant curriculum and pedagogy, but is established within traditional institutions of learning, like colleges or universities. And so I looked at examples of um, education outside of that. And so specifically looking at newspapers, uh, Chicano theater, and independent community schools and how those were used to educate uh, the community. Um, my, the frameworks that I use to sort of analyze this history um, is you, you, uh, Southwest Borderland Studies and Critical Race Theory in Education, which helped me sort of historicize and contextualize right, the uh, power, racial power dynamics that are a consequence of US takeover and the now uh, US Southwest, um, explain how those then power dynamics influence institutions of learning um, and also show how these alternative educational projects that I look at are a challenge to those uh, oppressive practices. Um, I, I have a chapter in which I sort of go into that, um, what I just mentioned and sort of the uh, historical um, racial dynamics and how they influence education. But my three analytical chapters um, are more about um, the, are, are more 
uh, concentrated, sorry, on the actual newspapers, the theater, and then the independent community school. Um, and so for my first chapter, I look at independent community-led newspapers here in New Mexico. Um, I argue that they have a culturally relevant education as defined by Ladinson Billings, who's a critical race theory and education scholar. Um, the, the newspapers that I look at had these recurring columns in which I argue they, they use those spaces to educate their community. Um, this is a, an example of one of those in which they took uh, literature that was first published in textbooks or in other educational um, places and published them in the newspaper again, right? So using the medium of accessible uh, uh, media to, um, to educate the community. Um, my second chapter looks at two theater troops in, in California, one Teatro Campesino, which I think most folks uh, who are familiar with the Chicano movement are, are familiar with, and then Teatro de las Chicanas, um, which was established in San Diego, California, um, both influenced by European and Mexican traditional um, theater practices. I, I argue that they educated the community in two ways. One, with their plays, by being able to use theater as an educational tool for, for community, but also they educated themselves by establishing and, and constructing um, alternative educational models. Um, Tetro Campesino using this uh, practice that they call theater of the sphere and Tetro Las Chicanas with the, the st these study group meetings that they were established in which they educated themselves both to become better actors or theater members, but also to sort of gain an education that was different from the one that they were receiving um, in schools. Uh, this is an example of, of one of the plays or a picture of, of one of the Teatro Campesino plays. Um, they use um, things like, you know, like the, if you see on the left-hand side, the, the guy wearing the, the, um, the, the police hat also has a, a pig mask. So it's, it's sort of, the, they use these, these strategies to make um, the message of their plays uh, accessible, right? And, and thus educational. Uh, chapter three looks at uh, Colegio Jacinto Trevino in Merced, Texas, which aimed again to address the, the educational needs of the community um, in, in, in Texas, um, which the established institutions around them could not meet, right? And so the Jacinto Trevino was established by agrarian workers um, and other in, in coalition with um, intellectuals in the area, right? Chicano intellectuals. Um, this is a, an example of what they saw sort of as their governing body, right? Which in the center is the committee that is, that is um, chosen to sort of, you know, um, govern the, the, the college, but all of the other programs that are part of the college are also sort of part of that, of that structure as well and have equal say. Um, and so at the moment, I've, I've been able to write and edit uh, to the first two chapters that I talked about I'm in the process of writing and editing the last chapter. Um, and as I continue this work and, and other work, um, my goal is to contribute to the history of educational activism, particularly among Chicanx communities, but other communities of color as well. Um, by highlighting this grassroots level education, right? We, we know of like sort of the long struggle, struggle for equitable education that includes desegregation of schools, again, the establishment of ethnic studies. Um, and so I, I wanna contribute by, by, um, by showcasing again, these so grassroots, grassroots, grassroots level alternative sort of examples, right? Um, and again, there are challenges to these oppressive educational practices. Um, and most importantly, they're community-based, right? Um, and so uh, that's just sort of an overview, again, of, of my project. I wanna thank my, my dissertation committee, some of, the, of whom are here today, and also, of course, uh, the Center for Regional Studies for supporting this, this project. Um, it was a little hard during COVID, as other folks have, have mentioned, sort of accessing the archives. And so um, it, was, it was really helpful to have the support of the Center for Regional Studies and others to be able to, to find some of these archival materials that were um, somewhat inaccessible during COVID. So thank you all. Okay. 
Yeah, I, as before, we have time for like one question, one comment. And by the way, keep on sending those chat comments and questions. I noticed uh, Carolyn received quite a few and so did Camilla. So keep on using those and that'll help also spread it around. But uh, one comment or question from somebody. Yep, I guess everybody uh, we're gonna you're gonna use chat then. All righty. I have a question. Oh, Lynn, yeah, go ahead. Lynn. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you've heard about uh, La Academia de la Nueva Raza up in Embudo, because that could be an interesting addition. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I um originally my my chapters were gonna cover all three states and all three mediums. Like so I was gonna talk about newspapers in Texas, California, and New Mexico. Um, and the same with the theater and the same with the schools. And so Academia de la Nueva Raza was gonna be the school that I wanted to focus on here in New Mexico. But unfortunately with COVID and everything, I just, you know, the archival sort of dig um, wasn't possible to the extent that I, that I had originally planned. So I had to, you know, um, re-strategize. And so I, yeah, I, I hope to be able to, um, to get back to those archives and be able to see that and write about that in, in the future. Thank you. Related to that, there's also La Escuelita, a program of the New Mexico Acequia Association. Anyway, okay, let's move ahead. We now have uh, Marianne Scahan. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name too badly. Marianne? Hi. Um, let me see if I can get my screen share. Can you see, can you see, can you see that? Okay. Yeah, it's coming on now. Okay. There we go. Yeah. And we see your Department of Anthropology. Yeah, okay, great. There's like three of you in this cohort. Yes. I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm not able, to, I'm sorry, I'm having a moment here. I can't find, um, why it's not, it's not going. Okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it this way because I don't want to mess with my um, full screen. Um, before I start, I'd like to say that my research, because I, I'm not I'm not Hickory Apache, so I wanted to say that my research at the Hickory Apache Res, um, Nation was supported by the Culture Committee and the Elders Council, and I received approval uh, from the Tribal Council to do this research. Um, and in my work, I strive to provide an appropriate and respectful support and advocacy for um, Native-led educational initiatives. And I also want to thank the Center for Regional Studies for the fellowship this year. Um, it was, it greatly helped um, the work that I, I could do, even though um, also my work was also impacted by COVID, um, but I am, I'm, great, I'm greatly appreciative of everything. Um, and before I start talking about my research, um, Alicia said that it might be a good idea to um, situate myself in the work that I did. So I'm just going to read this really briefly and be very mindful of the time. Um, but years ago, when I was studying for my grad comprehension exams, my master's, I went home to visit my mother over the summer. Although she was excited to have me home, she became a little annoyed when I was spending so much time reading and studying. One day she looked over at me and said, why do you study those books so closely? Who's writing those books? Do they know you? Do they love you? What kind of lessons are they trying to teach you? And then she continued, you read those words and I read my memories. You study those books and I study my mind and I remember the lessons of the people who loved me. Um, my mother was a Korean national and she grew up during a time when they were still occupied um, by Japan and um, her grade school experience was um, that she didn't go to Korean schools. She had to go to Japanese national schools. They taught in the Japanese language, which wasn't her native language. They changed her name and she said every day they made her realize or remember that she'll never be as good as um, the Japanese nationals because she was Korean. And um, although she didn't really like talking about those stories, um, her betrayal, her educational betrayal um, really impacted um, how I viewed my, my research experience. 
So my work was with the, is with the Hickory Apache Nation. Um, the title of this project is You Can't Teach Kids from a Book. Um, I am an anthropologist, but I work closely also with the linguistics department. Um, I work on language education and revival. And before I talk about my research, I just want to situate where the Hickory Nation is. This was their original tribal land. Um, they, um, uh, they, they had a semi-nomadic existence where the bands would travel around all through um, North, Southern Cal uh, Colorado, Northern New Mexico, all the way to Kansas, actually. And this little dark spot that you see here is where the actual res the reservation is today. The reservation was established in 1887. Okay. So my research investigates the impact on language educational experiences and personal histories on current tribal revitalization programs. Uh, the broader theme of my dissertation project explores how tribal members understand and reflect upon language use, shift, and communicative, communicative practices, and, and how these understandings of language inform, shape, um, current um, heritage revival initiatives. And these are my questions. I'll just go over those briefly since you can see them. But um, the bulk of my research was done by participant observation, um, some autobiographical interviews, and some short and longer formal interviews. And I've been working, um, I've been working with the Hickory Apache um, actually for about 15 years in different in different ways. So let's. I'm gonna. The history of education in Dulce is very similar to the, what happened to a lot of the tribal communities in the Southwest. Um, these are just some people from the um, culture camp I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but in um, 1903, there was a boarding school that was established at the Hickory Apache Nation. Um, children were forcibly taken um, to the boarding schools and they were only able to see their parents sometimes during the summer. Um, I did um, autobiographical interviews with some of the um, now elders, but the children that were part of the boarding school experience. Um, and for the for this fellowship year, I did some analysis, um, transcription analysis on some of these interviews. And I just briefly want to highlight one story by a woman named Suki. And she was taken she was forcibly taken to boarding school right after her fifth birthday. Um, and there was a floor that night, she said, the first night she was there, there was a floor that was for all the young children, for all the babies that were there. Um, and she was frightened and she was scared and she missed her family and she didn't speak English. But she, know, she recognized another friend who was roughly the same age. And that night her friends older sister, who was only about 10 or 11 at the time, um, came, down, um, came down to the ward with all the young children. Um, and she snuck down because she would have gotten in trouble if they saw her. And then she said for every night, almost every night, that young girl came down and she would tell them stories in Hickory and also sing to them in Hickory. And Suki told me the story um, at an um, elder's council meeting and the others that were roughly her same age recognized who this girl was. And she was known to them as the girl who would sing them to sleep while they were in boarding school. These are just some stock pictures. I, I don't have pictures of the girls. But um, the reason I'm doing these, uh, these biographical narratives to talk about education is um, the, they highlight the powerful ways that even children resisted language oppression and domination. And they also um, give examples of the ways that children are also carriers of their culture. Um, so one of, the, one of the main groups that I, I interviewed were um, Hickory Apache elders who are in their 70s and 80s who were part of the boarding school experience. And then another group that I interviewed were um, Hickory Apache teachers and advocates who are now in their um, 60s and 70s who are part of the very first 
language revitalization program in Dulce in roughly the 1970s. It happened right after the, the Indian Education Act. And one of the things that I've I heard from these interviews is that um, these these people, when they were children, they they really when they went back to school, they knew what traditional Western school looked like, uh, but they were shocked to see native teachers in a classroom trying to teach them Hikaria. Um, they weren't prepared. They felt that there was a disjuncture. And one of the things that keeps coming out was that different clans did it differently, but they, they had the expectations of um, knowing what the other clans were doing. Um, and then teasing was used a lot, which was traditional, but it, it only happens in certain social uh, relationships, but it happened to the whole class. And they um, and that this is what they said. One of the inter one of the excerpts is like, um, the teachers would make fun of my classmates saying things like, he doesn't know how to speak. He would, they would poke at them um, and say things like their ears are too thick. When we tried to learn the Korea, um, they felt those ladies were mean to us. Um, and one of the women that I interviewed who was part of that first group of the language classes is now a language teacher. And then she went on to say, um, before they don't speak, children, before they can't speak, they don't speak, they belong to the creator. After they speak, they belong to us. Um, children have always been sacred to us. That is why we nourish them. Um, I've heard them say, I've heard some people say that all we do is babysit, but we are medicine women. You're supposed to see the sacredness of our language in the children. And so a lot of, uh, and I've heard this theme over and over from tribal council members, from language teachers who are in their 60s and who are in their 60s and early 70s, um, that the very first language programs at Dulce were very top down. They were trying to teach them like you would teach a European language and there was, and they felt that they didn't really respect um, the children that, that they were and also the social relationships that they came from. And so a lot of the work that's being done contemporaneously, um, let's say since the 2000s, is when these, these first language students grew up and then they saw where they felt that the first teachers went wrong and they are trying to remedy um, this situation by really trying to make these language lessons um, in the curriculum a little more culturally relevant, more respectful of the way their community views language and confidence. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some of, just I'll briefly just show you some of the language pro, um, initiatives that have gone on. Um, this one was done, um, it was a dictionary project. It was published in 2007 with um, um, some of the Hickory Apache language experts under um, Dr. Melissa Axelrod, who is one of my dissertation co-chairs. This is Dr. Wilhelmina Foam. Um, and this is Maureen Spa, and she's still very active in um, language education. And Matilda has since passed. And another area that uh, they're taking language education right now is through these culture camps. So I was gonna talk about these in a little bit right now. Um, so how does language revitalization fits into culture camps? Socialization to activities and appropriate behavior are seen as foundational for language. So how people behave and where you teach the lessons are just as important as the language itself. Um, a couple years ago, I was at an elders council meeting, obviously before COVID, and I was brought to the elders council's intention, attention that um, the fifth graders were failing in English and they were not able to write and read uh, in English at, at the grade level. And um, the comments that went around was that they felt that in previous generations, when their parents knew how to speak Apache, they were much better at able to speak in English as well too. Um, that it was their multilingualism that really made them able to be good in Apache and in Navajo or Spanish and some of the other languages that they interacted in. 
And the lack of the ability of these fifth graders to write essays was seen as a lack of the cultivation of the mind, a skill that would have come if they knew how to speak Apache. I'm just um, showing you some slides of some of the more current programs. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with a comment made by um, a friend of mine, Wainwright Velarde, who actually just passed this past year. And he stresses it's impossible to separate the slice of Hickory life from its surrounding constituents. He reminds me of this fact when, he, when I mentioned my dissertation. He said he drew a timeline in the sand and he said, with the beginning that marked the beginning of life at one end and the end of life at the other end. And he said, everything you need to know in order to live as a Hickory Apache is contained in this one line. He continued, anthropology books, are things that they might call life ways or religion. He goes, that's just an artificial lifeline. Um, it's only one point in a segmented piece. It's only part of what it means to be Apache. So with COVID, I just wanted to mention briefly that um, they have been trying to do some more digital frames of less, lesson learning also to draw the interests of younger kids. This is a Hickory app that came out about two years ago and initially it was only for Hickory tribal members, but they made that available to everyone. The Mugunti Tea um, Institute is a nonprofit organization of elders and they were working on doing a curriculum that would have been um, available on Google. Um, and these are more pictures from culture camps because these kids are really cute. Um, in conclusion, again, I wanted to thank CRS for giving me this opportunity. I wanted to thank my dissertation co-chairs, Dr. Melissa Axelrod and Kate Rhodes. And I very much want to thank um, all the language advocates at the Hickory Apache Nation that has allowed me to work with them all this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, yes, uh, and thank all of you who've been sending comments via chat. I think those help a lot, Robert. We saw yours and Gabriel and others. So uh, yeah, keep those coming. And meanwhile, uh, one question or comment before we move on to Thatcher Rogers who will be our last presentation. Anybody really have something critical at this time? Okay, if not, then send it in by chat, if you will. And we have Thatcher Rogers. I, I hope you haven't left the group. No, he's still here. No, <laughs> Loyal. Okay, thank you for waiting. I know we're over time, but uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, um, hopefully everyone can see my screen share. Um, please let me know if you can't. Yes, it's on there. Okay, my, my uh, dissertation research is entitled uh, Between Casas Grandes and Salado, Community Formation Interaction in the Borderlands of the American Southwest, Mexican Northwest Region between uh, 1200 and 1450. So it's archeological, it's um, anthropological too. So I, I look at things such as ceramics and architecture, um, less tangible than others. And this is really, my research is really informed by um, the historical and lingering impacts on both archaeological research and archaeological thought and the way we tell, um, or that archaeologists and many people think of the past here in the American Southwest and in the Mexican Northwest. And I use that term specifically rather than Southwest or greater Southwest as previous archaeologists have to really emphasize that there's a there's a Northwest Mexican component to this area that really has a different history of research and understanding. And so not only is this border physical in the sense that it destroys archeological sites, disturbs human remains and ancestral boundaries, um, but it also uh, terminates archeological research at this area with different legal frameworks between the two regions. And the, the very sad fact that a lot of um, American archeologists refuse to work south of the border, not just because they have to work with Mexican colleagues, but the fact that means that they have to actually read and write in Spanish. Very arbitrary reason to stop. Um, and I look at this region as not just a, a historical borderlands, but really as an ancestral borderlands, because this area lies in this late pre-Hispanic period, this 1200 to 1450 period, between two relatively um, significant cultural phenomena that we think about that occur. The first one is Casas Grandes, which is located in northwestern Chihuahua, um, right at the site of uh, Nuevo Casas Grandes, if you've ever been in that city. 
um, at the site of Pakime, which is this uh, fairly sizable, um, almost a city you could call that, with a population of probably 5,000 individuals living there at this time, and what we think of as Salado, this shared um, kind of socio-religious system that's um, propagated through the exchange of these fairly standardized but elaborately painted decorated um, vessels out of East Central Arizona. And Salado is thought to be have emerged out of this um, southward migration of ancestral Pueblo people of northeastern Arizona um, into East Central Arizona, mixing with um, probably proto-Zuni, proto-Hopi groups and producing this, this pottery type. And for the area I'm working at, you can see the dots outlined in red are a bunch of the sites I'm working at, and they include sites in um, that are excavated, at least. I'm including assemblages from a lot more surveyed assemblages from south of the border um, with colleagues at Ina Sonora and Ina um, Chihuahua. And the description of these sites during this period of expansion of this Casagrande system, which is thought to be fairly politically complex, is that these sites are either really well interconnected with this ex with this burgeoning complex polity in northwest um, Chihuahua, or they're not. They're just isolated, um, very liminal sites that don't have a lot of um, shared attributes or tied into this network system. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm researching in my dissertation is, um, are these sites all integrated similarly into the system, or are there differences between and within sites? And then also, is there change over time between this 1200 to 1450 time period? And so here's a little bit about Pakime. Um, if you haven't been there, it's this wonderfully massive site that's, um, it can be truly described as unique in the Southwest, um, in the ancient Southwest, Northwest. Um, it has uh, Mesoamerican style architecture in a lot of respects, but also not. It has more macaws interred there, and they actually bred macaws there in the ancestral past. Um, it's the only site we know of to have had that and has over 80% um, of all macaws that have been recovered through archaeological investigations north of uh, Mesoamerica um, within the single site. It also has a variety of other very unique attributes and artifacts, such as a meteorite, very elaborate copper artifacts, um, what we call Chihuahuan polychrome, as you can see in the upper left and upper right, and then um, turquoise, of course, and these Mesoamerican style ceramic hand drums. And overall, these are what we think of as being maybe a, a, a very complex polity that had a lot of interregional connection to other groups. Um, contrasting this to Salado, um, north of the border, as I said, and they both are widely distributed ceramics, particularly Salado. Um, Salado is really characterized by use of, um, of these polychromatic uh, ceramic vessels that are fairly large, oftentimes, as you can see here, probably used in um, intercommunal feasting events to really aggregate and um, uh, form inclusive um, aspects uh, between these different uh, heritages because they're thought of as being Mugion, Hohokam, Ancestral Pueblo, um, uh, Hohokam being the um, ancestral peoples of the Otham, and Mugion being ancestral peoples of the um, of the uh, Zuni, Akama, uh, Hopi, uh, Apache, uh, many other groups as we think of it um, for many other historical reasons. And so I'm really looking at these interplay between these two groups. And as I said, uh, Salado is really kind of um, uh, differentially interpreted by a lot of archaeologists. But the main conclusion that most people think of it is that one of the things that really um, initiated this um, emergence of the Salado identity, um, as we think of it, is the movement southward of northeastern Arizona and Central Pueblo people um, during the late 1200s into the area around Safford and East Central Arizona, um, as you can see here by this uh, D-shaped kiva um, uh, uh, communal ceremonial structure um, at the Goat Hill site, which is just north of Safford. And the sites I'm looking at are what's called the Animus phase, and they share attributes predominantly of um, Casas Grandes, so you've got these Chihuahuan polychromes, as you can see here, but the problem with these sites is they were predominantly excavated in the 1920s and a few in the 1950s, and then what I'm working with for uh, my uh, Center for Regional Studies um, Research Fellowship were sites that were salvage excavated off ranches in southeastern Arizona around the Chiricahuas, and those sites were extensively looted, so we don't have a, a lot of good data from them, so my analysis is the first analysis of these. And the animus phase has really been thought of as being, as I said, extensively networked with this emergent complex polity in northwestern Chihuahua, um, but at the same time it's a little different. So it 
perhaps as a cultural borderlands in the past. And it shares architectural attributes that are fairly unique, such as these um, T-shaped doors and the fact that there are these, pl um, these uh, plastered hearths um, with terraces in them. But one of the things that makes this landscape very unique is that it exists in a um, in, a, a, in what we call Sky Islands, these northwest south running um, mountain chains that divide uh, these wide interplane valleys uh, that perhaps create a lot of, in southeastern Arizona at least, um, result in long-term cultural dif differences from valley to valley. And so I wanted to look at this more by really focusing on this southeastern Arizona component that's really been de-emphasized and then also into uh, northeastern Sonata with my colleagues there. Um, and for my methods, I'm looking at these, these sites right here, as well as um, I'm using um, a sample here, and I'm looking at uh, uh, ceramic materials from these excavated sites, as well as architecture, some mortuary data that were not, um, thankfully they did not um, disturb that many human remains during excavations there. Um, I'm using a lot of survey um, data, so I don't have to disturb future sites. Um, and I'm using uh, more advanced analyses such as INA, instrumental uh, nutrient activation analysis, to really identify where ceramic artifacts were being produced and where they were being exchanged, to really identify which communities were um, actively engaging in exchange and networking with local communities and also regional communities. I'm also looking at settlement patterning, such as um, whether or not they have communal features such as plazas or in the case of the um, the southwestern New Mexico sites and the um, northwestern Chihuahua sites, they have uh, actually these ball courts, um, which are really important features down in Mesoamerica and then also here. Um, if they have restrictive spaces such as uh, uh, pit, uh, communal pit rooms or kivas as we might think of them. And then uh, if these sites are clustered or if they're more interwidely dispersed or not and how they date over time, which I'm doing here using ceramics and architecture, I'm going to um, reconstruct a rough population estimate using um, Bayesian statistical modeling, which I'll also apply to radiocarbon dates to improve um, identifying when sites were occupied and when they may have become more depopulated over time or maybe modified. And I just want to present a few preliminary results because I've analyzed uh, uh, on nearly 6,000 shards from the Arizona sites, so, which is almost uh, my 20% sample I really wanted to get. And what's really interesting that I'm identifying from the Arizona site sample, the shard sample, so I've got complete vessels and then I've got what I actually find, which are these little tiny fragments of fired ceramic material, is that I'm getting later dating um, solato types such as Dinwiddie polychrome and New Mile and Nine Mile polychrome. Um, which really suggests that the sites in southeastern Arizona were occupied much later than those that have all of the traditional hallmarks of Casas Grandes and we would have thought were more readily integrated into that larger system. So these date later than the, than the uh, sites in southwestern New Mexico. I'm also getting this local type called Cloverdale corrugated and this is a really important type because I have greater variability within these sites and I'm, that's one of the attributes I'm recording, which suggests it was locally produced and exchanged elsewhere. And this is the ceramic type that's used as the hallmark for, oh, there's um, regional interaction with uh, Chihuahuan sites here. And so it suggests that, that maybe that's not really true. And then the last thing I'm getting are these um, San Pedro Valley types, which are located to the west, um, such as Bob Marty polychrome and, and Santa Cruz polychrome. And the presence of these really suggests that um, sites in southeastern Arizona are perhaps more readily integrated with sites in um, to the west than they are to sites to the east, which is um, kind of an unexpected um, result I have. And when you compare it to, as I said, these, is, these are complete vessels or partially um, reconstructed vessels from a site in southwestern New Mexico. I'm getting slightly different, slightly similar Salado types, but very different. And I'm getting far fewer Cloverdale Corgate to this local planeware and a lot more Chihuahuan types. Perhaps these are more readily integrated. And there's uh, several significances of this research that I really want to convey. The, the first one is um, we really don't think of uh, borderlands as really having existed in non-state, non-complex societies, but really they did. And these borderlands are areas for really dynamic movement of both people and ideas over time. And so this is one way I'm looking at this. The second, perhaps um, uh, more, more important conclusion, at least for um, significance for uh, the Center for Regional Studies, is the fact that it's a trans-border research. I'm working with my Mexican colleagues, both in Sonora and Chihuahua. I'm working with local communities and institutions down in southeastern Arizona and here in New Mexico. And it's really this, um, this approach to really integrate data from four states 
that really hasn't happened before. As I said, most data, um, most projects just stop right at the border and almost no projects have been really done in, um, across the border. And I'm also trying, um, working with um, local groups there to also present the results there to the rural communities there. So that way they can understand um, both their um, ancestral heritage for indigenous groups there, but also the land and the heritages of which they're stewards um, for Anglo and Hispanic communities. And I just want to um, just briefly thank my uh, my chair, Emily Jones, and um, my committee and a list of other colleagues, uh, Jupiter Martinez, especially as my INA contact, and then um, my um, several funding agencies, including the Center for Regional Studies. And that's, yeah, I think, I think that's five, probably over. Well, thank you, Thatcher. Gosh, uh, very exciting as all of our other presentations. And we've come to the end here. But certainly, if someone has a question or a comment to Thatcher before we close up the proceedings, uh, Welcome to, to do that. Anybody? Uh, yeah, Samuel? Yes, I, um, really great paper. I want to talk with you afterwards about it, but I'm wondering what connections you're seeing, especially with the San Pedro sites, with the Rio Sonora kind of ancestral Opata kind of area. Yeah. Um... So I'm looking at some of those for a side project. Um, and unfortunately, we're missing a lot of the, the data for that for the late time period. I mean, that's recent, that's now being investigated um, by a team under um, under by Matt Pales at Oklahoma and then also Ines and our colleagues there. I, I think you're right that there is a really strong connection there. Um, I, I don't think there's as much along the San Pedro, even into Sonora, where it looks to be more Tono Atom, not necessarily mm -hmm. Opata Atom. Um, and perhaps a little bit of, of um, San Javier, um, of the, the drawing a blank right now, and I shouldn't, um, the group that now lives at, at San Javier del Bac. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I, I see these connections, but it's a bit different. Okay, Th thanks. Okay, and by the way, as Alicia mentioned at the beginning, we did record all of these. So if you do want to go back to some of these, because I know we had to move on very quickly, we actually went over time. Sorry, but uh, that happens, uh, and so it will be. It's recorded, and if you have any questions or comments to the students, I'm sure we can handle them. If you just send them to the office, we'll make sure we route them to the appropriate student, or you can contact the students directly if you use the UNM directory for email addresses if you want to do it that way. So uh, thank everybody, all the presenters for sure. And also uh, we have several of our advisory group members here. Uh, I'd like to thank them for you know participating in this. And we also have several faculty uh, members uh, present as well. Uh, and also Mr. Valenzuela from the state legislature was able to join us. Thank you uh, for joining us, Mark. Uh, and I'll turn it over for the last comments to our director, Dr. Lloyd Lee. Well, thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, this is an amazing set of, of works that, I, that are being done and I'm looking forward to uh, reading uh, all of the dissertations when they're done and then eventually hopefully future book publications with this. This is amazing. Um, thank you everyone for being here for um, and Jose for, for moderating, Alicia for setting up our Zoom and setting up the program and, and being our contact person with all of the students. RC uh, for all of her work in terms of uh, helping with um, CRS and her film and digital projects. And so we're going to be um, uh, definitely uh, engaging with other uh, future initiatives and projects coming up in the next few months and, and the rest of this year. So please stay tuned. Uh, check us out again on our Facebook page, uh, Center for Regional Studies. Uh, thank you again so much for being here and we appreciate all of you. Adios.